Okay, uh, before we start talking about uh, chapter six under the title morphology, we need to go back for a short while to remember the things that we had already talked about in chapter five. With chapter five, uh, in the previous weeks, we uh, said that we have some processes for word formation. Chapter six in one basket is about morphology, and morphology is defined as the formation of words. Now, how to do formation? How to form new words? How to form words to change the category of the verb, or the category of the, of the word itself? We need what? We need the processes, and these processes had been dealt with in Chapter 5. To recall these processes rapidly, we had, if you remember, neologisms uh, as a process. Then we talked also about etymology, borrowing. Under this title, borrowing, we have compounding and blending. But another process is the clipping. And below clipping, we have hyper or uh, hypochorisms and back formation. The next one is conversion and uh, coinage, below which we have acronyms. The last two processes were derivation, and we will talk about derivation today also, uh, in which we have prefixes, suffixes, and infixes as well. And the last process is uh, under the title of multiple processes. It means when we have more than one process that may take place to change the form of the verb. It means also, for example, we may have a clipping as well as we have uh, acronyms at the same time, or we may have uh, compounding, uh, sorry, borrowing and conversion, or maybe compounding at the same time. So that's why we call this process as multiple, uh, not me, of course, the book, uh, uh, multiple processes. Now, critically, as I said, uh, if you remember, before I start uh, or starting introdu start introducing the, the chapter, we said that we need to ask a critical question that is related to the understanding of morphology. Morphology is not only seen from a grammatical point of view. This type of study uh, can be, uh, or uh, may fall in uh, when you study grammar uh, in, in the grammar classes. But when you study language as an introduction to the, to the, to the term, we need to understand the critical point, I mean, I mean the significance from a linguistic point of view of understanding morphology. To start with, uh, this is a very important question we need to ask ourselves uh, repeatedly whenever we come across a station uh, like the one that we are uh, dealing with today. It is to ask a critical question when you come across each linguistic item. This is very important to learn uh, how to deal with the, with the material itself. Now, let's know the significance as well as the importance of studying morphology. So, the morphological awareness, it means the morphological, morphological knowledge, can help language learners to be familiar with the lexical derivations, and within which we need also to know and to understand the meaning of the morphemes or the, uh, uh, the elements that might be attached to a word. Okay, so this is one thing. And within this process, ultimately, these all, we as learners uh, will be able to realize, uh, to some extent, the English language has certain morphological logic. It means it has some certain morphological regulations. Through these regulations and rules, learners can follow to know and to produce maybe new words. And these new words, of course, will enable us to what uh, to perfectly produce and understand the words that we have never heard before, if we also understand what, or if we know the root of that word. For example, uh, we have a word which, uh, which we will be dealt with uh, within the coming sections, like renew. So re is the prefix, and the new is the stem. Stem, who are Judah, who are Kenyam al Asas. And whatever is added are called elements. And the elements also have another terminology. We will talk about it also later. 
So now we need to understand that re means again, and new is an adjective in, in general, in, 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 the, in, in the original form, but when we add re, when we attach re to the beginning of this word, we produce another category of that one. So it is, it will be changed, sorry, from an adjective into a, a verb. So this is one thing. Um, this utility or the utilization or the use of morphology or the awareness in the morphological stance uh, will help us as learners to what? To be a better writer and a better speaker. Generally, we will be a better user of that language. The language, uh, uh, our, destiny, our destination is to learn the language, to learn the linguistic aspects of language. So we need to recognize the different aspects uh, uh, in the, uh, let's say, in everyday dialogues or maybe in, in our writing. So it, it, it enables us to what, again, to be or to uh, make us or to take advantage from this morphological awareness to be a better writer as well as a better speaker or, let's say, in general, a better use, user of that language. Um, uh, also, when we deal with morphology, uh, we will also be able to produce non-finite sentences order or sentence orders so we can actually play with the order within the rubric of grammar to produce as we said before if you remember that there is the ability to produce non-finite number of sentences we cannot limit or we cannot count the number of sentences okay we have some limited approximately limited number of words but the limitation of or counting uh, the, the number of sentences is not an easy job. Uh, uh, let's say it is impossible. Uh, also, the study, <clears throat> and this is the last point before I uh, uh, start talking or including the material in the book, it helps us, I mean, the study of morphology helps us to understand the shared uh, uh, characterizations and aspects between two or maybe more than two languages. Um, this study, uh, this is also uh, uh, when we take advantage of the uh, morphology itself. So now, understanding uh, or being able to notice what are these share points or share points between two languages maybe uh, uh, help us to understand uh, how this is affected uh, or how is this included under the pragmatic aspects, which is in, uh, uh, in a later chapter, of course, in the book. So uh, uh, now in general, let's say in general, we can say that the study of morphology is not only an option, it's not optional. It is a must, it is something mandatory, ijbari, ilzami, for any language learner. Why? Because it, uh, it can be or it can help us, or it provides us with an, uh, 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 with an ability that enables or that uh, makes us able to use the language in a better way. So this is, in general, uh, I may go back again to know the relationship between the languages when we sometime have, sometimes have a look at the, at the lines that I'm presenting in front of you. Now, we have a word in Swahili, uh, you, the one that I'm pointing to. Uh, here, this, it, it seems for the, from the first time, nitakopenda uh, is a, a single word. This is in Swahili. Sorry, nitakopenda is Swahili word. It's not in English. But if we translate this word into English, we get what? We get four words instead of one. How can we control, how can we uh, uh, be able to understand uh, that one word may mean or may be uh, uh, translated into more than one, let's say four, maybe five, and vice versa. Sometimes we have one single English word, and when this word is translated into Arabic, it may give us uh, more than two or three words. At the same time, when we have one Arabic word, uh, uh, and this word is uh, within the process of translation. 
it may uh, be translated into three or four words. And I think I talked about uh, this facility. Why we have this? Because uh, sometimes we, in, in a particular language, we don't have uh, the vocabulary to cover uh, uh, or to be even in all languages. That's why sometimes we need to borrow a word from that language to what to be included in the in the lexical. Uh, you see here the book splits the one word. It is one word. It cannot be splitted, by the way, in Swahili. But for the purpose of understanding and uh, give a clear explanation to the uh, relationship between these two languages, the book splits these words into four syllables, as you can see. So now here we have ni to mean I, ta to mean well, ku to mean you, and panda we have love. The result is I will love you. Okay, so this is a literal translation. It doesn't give a complete meaning because we don't have in English a plan to love somebody. This is not uh, actually, this is not real, but it is just for the purpose of clarification. Now, <clears throat> uh, what we have also uh, sometimes, uh, let me read some of the lines. Uh, it would seem that the Swahili word is rather different from what we think of as an English word. Yet, there clearly is some similarity between the languages. And that similar elements of the whole message can be found in both. Perhaps a better way of looking at linguistic forms, this is my point, in different languages would be to the use or to use this notion of elements. So elements means what? We will see what is or what does it mean, rather than depend on identifying only words. So now this type of exercise, yeah, I mean, it means investigating the, uh, the meaning of the uh, sharing aspects or the shared aspect between two languages, uh, uh, performed in an example of investigating basic forms in language, which is generally not as morphology. So morphology is what, again, is uh, the investigation in the forms or in the formation of the word in one language or maybe across than two or three languages. So broadly, the study of forms is the uh, is morphology. Now, what can be uh, included within one word? We have maybe different elements. As I said in the beginning, we have, for example, uh, uh, renew, re, and renew. These are two elements, and uh, of course, we will figure out the uh, the uh, and recognize the difference between these re and the new in the coming sections. Uh, now, these elements in general are known as morphemes. Let's know more about morphemes. Now, before I ask you to tell me uh, what do you know about morpheme or morphemes, now, do you have any question? Is everything clear up to this point? Or do you need further explanation? Any questions, guys, please? Say yes or no. Uh, yes. Clear. Yes. So in the beginning, we started with what? We started with the significance of studying morphology. So remember, we have these significant points the, uh, uh, behind which we study morphology. Now, morphemes. I'm not going to start talking about morphemes. I will give you uh, the the floor to tell me what is meant by morphemes. If you have any idea, please let me see your hands raised. Okay, uh, I can see uh, not the full name because I'm sharing you uh, the the book, the PDF version. Mm, uh, some Mahmoud Shakar Abdul Samad. ما أعرف اسمك بالبداية شنو اسمك شوية؟ ماروة ماروة يس ماروة please tell me what do you know about morphemes then I may move to ask for Khan and Abdurrahman the morpheme it's the word that is abstracted from any addition on the condition that that it gives a meaning such as the word car or play and it's a it's a meaningful linguistic unit consists of a word such as a dog or uh, a word element such as uh, the S 
the end of the dogs that I yeah. understood the morphine. Right, right, you are correct. And this is not in the book. However, thank you very much for uh, uh, searching the internet to uh, know more about morphine. This is a very excellent way to understand the thing that we feel it is a little bit complicated. Okay, uh, we have Farqan now. Yes, sir. Uh, I understood the morphine uh, is a minimal unit of a minimal unit of, uh, of meaning, of meaning or, uh, or grammatical function. This is great. Okay, so this is the definition of morphemes. Do yes, you want sir. to add something before I ask Abdurrahman? Okay, thank you very much. Oh, yes, Abdurrahman. Uh, no, sir. Ah, no, sir. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Yes, Abdurrahman. Yes, sir. Please, uh, you raise your hand. Tell me what do you have. Okay, sir. Okay. Start this up off the Ijal at the Slavs. That's okay. It's not the proper time to have any call now, Abdurrahman, but uh, I may uh, go to give you some further explanation to the presentation you made. Now, uh, we have. This stem, stem معناها الجدع أو الكلمة الأساس. الكلمة الجدر. Sometimes it's called stem, some other times it's called root. Okay, فهي الكلمة الأساس. Now, talks, talker, talked, and talking. All these are having what? Are having more than one element. Now, the basic element of these four words is talk. This is the basic one. This is the original one. And for this word, the book adds S to tell us something. ER to tell us something else. And uh, so, ED so. and ING. Okay. So now we have what? We have one element which is talk. Beside this, we have what? We have what? We have another or other four elements. There are, as you see, S. -S E R E D and I N G. These are not put hazardly. Laisa li li gaya salbiya or laisa li ay gaya la la yajid laha ay ma'na. But when I have the S here, I may have uh, I may have, for example, uh, Ahmed usually talks rapidly, or somebody drives his or her car, maybe their car, uh, slowly. So now the S here, may it may mean what? It may mean the, uh, the, the reflection of the present tense. The ER, almost when we have, for example, teach, teacher, play, player, this ER changes the word from a verb into a noun. When we have the ED form, we have basically what? Uh, we have the uh, the uh, the past form of a verb. The ing indicates what uh, indicates the continuity of a particular activity. So he is talking. Somebody is. I'm talking now. This is uh, uh, to tell you that the the, the, the activity is still uh, processing. Now, in general, we have what we have one element, the basic element, the root, and I think you study this in the grammar. And uh, we have some uh, other uh, elements that are found in front of you. So all these are what are morphemes. Back to Furqan, if I'm not mistaken, she said or she defined the morpheme as the minimal unit of meaning or grammatical function. So these two will be also splitted uh, in becoming lines. So units of a grammatical function include what? Include forms used to indicate, for example, the past tense or the plural. Now, student, students. Now here we have the S. But this S is not to indicate a form, uh, I mean a tense. It indicates the plural form of the word, student, students. So this S should also be recognized from the S of the third person singular. And here we have what? Here we have one another, another, sorry, another benefit or significant significance to the study of morphology because it helps us differentiate between the forms. 
Here we talk about tense when we add third person singular. The same as, as may be understood as a plural when we deal with nouns. Okay, so uh, here we have example. You see the renewed. Uh, renewed as a word consists of one minimal unit. What is that minimal unit, guys? It's new. This is the stem word. And we have some extra units or units. Here we have the re, re, new, which means again. And we have a grammatical function, which is the past tense. Now, again, the stem word is what is new as a what? As an adjective. It is preceded by the re, re, gain, to mean what? To have a unit of meaning, which is again. And we have a grammatical function as well, which is the indication of the, uh, the indication of the past tense by the uh, ed. Again, here we have tourists, as you see. This basic word or the stem is tour, and we have the ist to indicate the tourist as uh, somebody, and we have the s plural. So again, we have three things to consider. We have to know the basic stem where which is tour and we have the ist to uh, to refer to the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the grammatical function sorry the, uh, the 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 second addition or the additional uh, uh, unit and we have the ed to indicate a minimal unit of uh, of the past tense um uh, here this is the uh, sorry the s to indicate plural, I'm sorry. Now, how many types of morphemes do we have in the book? I want somebody to tell us something about the types of morphology. Uh, aside from Furqan and Abdurrahman, I may go uh, Noor Bakr, Ghlayim, I guess, Noor? Yes, sir. Go ahead, please. Free uh, more. A free and common morphemes. Okay, so free these morphemes. are the let's say the the uh, uh, the basic types of morphemes. We have free morpheme and bound morpheme. Tell me something about free morpheme, please. Yes, uh, free morphemes. Uh, it is morphemes that can stand by themselves as okay. single words. Correct. Yes. Okay. And bound morphemes. Uh, uh, morphemes uh, that cannot normally stand alone okay. are typically attached, attached right. to attached another attached to the three morphemes. Another form. Good. Yes. So maybe they are resembled in the prefixes and suffixes, right? Generally by affixes. And now here we have free morpheme. When we have, for example, the word new, the word sur, these can stand alone by themselves. They give meaning. For bound morphemes, it means the attachments, the elements that we attach to the stem. Here, we have what? We have the bound morpheme. Why bound morpheme? Because they cannot stand alone by themselves. Do they play any role? category of the very word. But they cannot stand alone. They must be attached to a free morpheme. Okay. Um, this is very clear explanation to the uh, to the elements in general. We have the dress. This is an extra example. The dress is the stem. Un, and we have ed. These are what? These are the morphemes. Uh, the result is unaddressed. So we have a prefix and we have an affix. But here we have what? Two suffixes. Sorry. We have here a prefix and here we have a suffix. But here we have the stem in the beginning, and it is attached to two more elements as uh, suffixes. Similarly, we have with the, uh, with the examples left here, as you can see. So, ness or less, these are bound morphemes. Why? Because they cannot stand alone. While uh, also ed, sorry, cannot stand alone. Un cannot stand alone. While dress and care, they are free morphemes because they give meaning. They can be understood by themselves. There are a number of English words in which the element treated as the stem is not a free morpheme. This is not the end of the quote. 
we have something else. We need to add something else, which is the word, for example, receive. Now here we have re. My question, is this re or are these are two letters, r and e, similar to the ones added to renew or they are different? What do you think? If I say renew or I say receive, are these re similar or different? What do you think? Raise your hand, please, if you have any answer. No answer? Sir, I am raising my hand. Oh, I didn't see your hand actually. Yeah, it's, it's clear now. Yes, sir, it's different. It's not oh. the same. This type, this, call, uh, this type called bounce team and these words that have an affixes but they are not a free morphemes wow. because uh, uh, um, re receive you gave it as example a uh, sieb is not a word it's not a team it does not can, have can, can receive be split into two units no it cannot because re can the word renew be split into two units yes ah. That's why we say, as you said exactly, you did a very nice job when you said that these two are E letters are different. Why? Because in the first example, renew, it means again. But here, it's basic in this word. We cannot split it. If we do, what will happen, Fatma? If we split R E from C, what do we it get? It won't have any meaning. It's not it's, a word. It, it will be, it won't be understandable. Right, meaningless. Yes. So you see here we have different examples. We have receive, reduce, repeat. So repeat also, RE cannot be separated from P. If we do, we get a meaningless element. Okay, now let's move to talk about the types of free morphemes. How do you know one? Now, our annual free morphemes. What are these, please? Let me see your hands again. Anybody is interested in tell us the types of uh, of free morphemes? Nobody. Okay, Yasemin, please. Sir. Yeah. Uh, the free morphemes are divided into two parts. Okay. The first being verbs, noun, adjective, and content. Uh, what, the... what do we call these, Yasemin? The nouns. Adjectives, adverbs, what do we call these? Lexical. What type of free morpheme are these? Lexical and functional morpheme. Yes, I mean, let me give you the same question, but in a different way. Just, just okay. wait a minute. Now, what are the types of free morphemes? Uh, the lexical and functional How many morphemes? times do we have, yes, I mean? Two. Uh, we, have, we have two. What are, number one is what? Uh, free and bound. Um, this is not exactly the correct answer, but it is just highlighted just in front of you, Yasemin. We have lexical morphemes and we have functional morphemes. Yeah, uh, the lexical and functional... Uh, yeah, tell uh, me something about the lexical morphemes. The lexical, it's uh, one of the types, the uh, free morpheme. It's it is a type of a free morpheme. This is, this is okay. But I mean, give, can you give me some examples? Uh, like um, uh, the verbs and nouns, adjective, the adverb, the carry okay. contact so, and you know, meaning. Okay. Now... The... Uh -huh. Okay. Say, so, look. We also can call it not me, of course. Again, it, it, uh, these words are, are called also content words. Content words like girl, man, house, house. tiger, sad, etc. So okay. all these are lexical morphemes. Zen. Thank you very much, Yasemi. This is good. 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 Okay. You. Now, what is the fee one of the main features of lexical morphemes? A very important one. Fatma again. Abdul Majid. There is an open class of words. Ah, open class of words. Now, what's the meaning of open class? This is a very important point. <clears throat> you can use it easily in language. 
without adding it to another word? Uh, not exactly, Fatma. Okay. Open, okay. open a class of words. It means maybe something else. Uh, Fatma. Yes, sir. Now, can you tell me when did you learn the meaning of COVID-19? When, when did you learn the, that? Word? When the in, virus started. In which year? 2019. 2019, maybe 2020. No, 2020, yeah, sorry. 2020, that's okay. Now, uh, do you know this, or did you know this word, for example, in 2015? No. Al virus in Arabic, let's say. Now, we as Arabic speakers, as native Arabic speakers, didn't have any idea before 2019 what is the meaning of al virus taji? We hear about virus very repeatedly, but we don't have any specific understanding to the al virus taji. That's I why we call, yeah. That's why we call this one uh, lexical morphine. We call it as open class. Why? Because there is because the possible. Can add new words to the language. Add, yes, this is it. Because yes. there is the possibility to add new words to the lexical. Or to the lexicon. Ah, that's why it's called what? Open class. Now the second time is what? Thank you very much, Fab. Uh, yes, Noor Mahsin, please. Functional morphine uh -huh. uh, that is used a functional word such as a conjugation uh, or a pre uh, preposition. Uh, Prepositions, and, conjugations, and uh, and called uh, that articles. Is a class. Mm -hmm. Ah. Because now, we can uh, cannot uh, add uh, functional morphine. Uh -huh. Because there is no possibility to add a new pronoun to the English language. There is no possibility to add a new preposition or a new conjunction or a new definite or non-definite article. That's why they are closed. So, open because there is the possibility to add new words. Closed because there is no possibility to add a new word to that list. Clear, guys? Yes, sir. So, yes, sir. Uh, any questions before I proceed? Any question? Well, now let's talk about how the, this is the end of the story of free morphemes. Now, we have now time to talk about bound morphemes. Yes, let me see your hands. Yes, Abdurrahman, please. Yes, uh, bound morpheme is a word or element that cannot stand alone, cannot stand alone as a word. And usually uh -huh. it's attached or connected to another word. Uh, for right. example, be... for hmm. example, uh, uh, R-E or I-S-T or E-D. Uh, Good. So they, uh, so... Uh, they are they are affixes finally, so we can uh -huh. say all oh, affixes. It's uh, bound morphine, bound uh, morphine. Or, or, or prefixes and suffixes in English. You know and in English, uh -huh. okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. and uh, the affixes or suffixes in English, it's a uh, bound morphine. Okay, bound morphine. Now, what is the benefit of bound morphemes? Can we take any advantage of bound morphemes or it is just something or an element that is added to the word and that's it. Now, can we take uh, any advantage from the N-E-double-S? Sickness, goodness. What do we understand from the word when it is attached to N-E-double-S or when it is uh, ended with M-E-N-T? It's to make... Yes, for, yes, ah, yes. Okay, Abdurrahman. To, to make a new words? No, no, not only to make a new word. We talked about it. But I mean, when you find a word like development, when you see that word is ended with M-E-N-T, Murtaba, what can you say about a word, I mean, the category of the word when it ends with M-E-N-T? Uh, sir, uh, to make a different uh, grammatical uh, category. Uh -huh. Which is school. what now with M-E-N-T? Development, development. Now, develop, is it a verb 
a noun, an adjective, or an adverb? Develop. Develop is a verb, sir. Development. It's a verb. No. What about development, Fatma? Is the noun of development. Ah. What do we understand from this? I want you to yeah. refer. We can add suffixes to form new or to make new words okay. and new grammatical okay. Uh, okay, this is okay. But I mean, when you have a word and you yes. come across a word while reading a story, maybe a novel or whatever, and you find that word ends with M-E-N-T or N-E-S-S, and your little brother or sister asks you this question, what does this mean? Is it a noun or a verb? What would you say? You would say it is? Development is what? Yalla, development is what? Abdul Rahman? It's a noun? It's a noun. How can you recognize? How can you figure out? It's a noun. For example, you don't know development. You don't know the meaning of development. By the addition M-E-N-T. Yes. Ah. So this is one of the benefits, one of the advantages that we can take from what, take of what? Take of, of morphology. Because it helps us to understand the category of the word. It helps us to decide whether this word is a noun, a verb, or, or whatever. This is one of the benefits. Later, for example, if it happens that you will be asked for a question what are the benefits? What are the uh, the uh, the significant uh, or the significant uh, points or the significant aspects of studying morphology? You may come across this answer. It forms a new categories from which we can decide this is a noun or we can decide the category of the word. Okay, we can also decide the form, the tense of the word, whether this is a present past, continuous, maybe, or future. Am I clear? Did I make myself clear now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Clear. So now we have, again, the, uh, the, uh, the derivational morphemes. Um, uh, we said that we have uh, these morphemes, which belong to the bound morphemes, and uh, we can recognize the category of the word from these elements. Also, we have a number of examples, as you see here, we have the R, E, the P, R, E, the E, X, and so on. Now, let's move to the inflectional morphine. It is the second type of bound morphine. Its second set of bound morphemes contains what are called inflectional morphemes. Now, here, we have very clear explanations to these elements that can be attached or added to the end of the word or maybe before the word. Here we have some additions that are added to the end of the word. Now this apostrophe S, is it similar to this S or what? What do you think? Are these two S's similar or different? Let's say are these three S's different or similar? The apostrophe S the Can S. I answer them? Yeah, please, go ahead. It's Tell different, me how sir. this one. It's different, sir. Ah, they are different. Tell me about the job, Marta. Show them they are different. Uh, the, the first one, sir, it's, uh, it's as the plural as. And the For second position. Is, uh, the third. For position. The third one, look. For possessive, sir. And, and uh, the second one is uh, one for, for what? plural. For plural. plural. The third one is for what? Uh, for abbreviation. Uh, for, for third yeah. person singular. For third person singular. This is okay. Now, yes. morphology tells us, okay? Morphology tells us the difference or the difference among these three S's. Okay, guys? Now. This one is what is the position. This one is plural, and this one is the third person singular. These two are added to nouns, but this one is added to verbs. To what to indicate a present form of a verb. Now, again, we have uh, this one is always laughing. 
Now, uh, this ING means continuity. Okay? Now, this ED, is it what? It, it indicates what? The other liked. What do you think? Very quickly, please. Quickly. This ED in the past tense. Past tense. Past tense. Now, what about the EN here? What does it indicate, the EN? The past participle. Past participle. Now, we have the past here. Now, what do we have here? We have liked and we have taken. What are these two, please? When did you have any issue with the grammar? So, with verbs? With verbs. Now, why we have EN here and we have ED here? Why not the opposite? I, why don't we take this, for, this one for granted? Whenever we have a, a, a verb, we add the ED or we add the EN. Why we have ED and EN maybe? This is one of the examples of, of EN. Yeah, tell me. Let me see your hands raised. The second one, sir. E? For adjective. The second one? Look. As a child and has always taken. Is this an adjective? No, sir. So it is aware of, uh, it is what? She's someone I am a little bit of a break, broke, broken, a cut, 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 like, 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 she's someone I have a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little bit صار الموضوع بسيط جدا يعني اخذته من متوسطه هذا. شو يسمون هاي العمليه لما اضيف انا الاي دي او اصرف الفعل؟ يعني انا حكيتها لكم اليوم. استاذ تصريفات الفعل. تصريف تصريف الافعال اكو عندي وي هاف تو تايبس اوف اوف كونجيجيشن. اسمها باللغه الانجليزيه كونجيجيشن اوف فيربس. كونجيجيشن اوف فيربس. تصريف الافعال. وي هاف تو تايبس اوف اوف وي هاف ذا ريجولار اند وي هاف ذا ريجولار. الاعتيادي والشاذ، الاعتيادي يضاف لاي دي والشاذ. So this is very, very, very simple question. Now, I'm not going to go deeper with this, but this shortens the longest story. Uh, no, with nouns, we deal with the apostrophe S with S for a plural. With verb or verb, generally, we what? We may use the S, third person singular, the ING for continuity, the E, D, and EN for what? For verb conjugations, with the past participle, maybe. With adjectives, we don't have S's or ING's. We have what? Maybe sometimes we have, but this is not the, 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 the proper room or time to talk about the words that end with ED or with ING to form adjectives. No, we are just trying to figure out the main differences among these in general. Now, with, with the adjectives, we deal with the ER and the EST, with the comparative degree, and we have the superlative degree so these all under what under the umbrella of morphology morphology again helps us figure out and understand these types of elements that are added to the words is everything clear or do you have something to say please everything is clear sir uh, yeah hope hope so <laughs> everyone everyone finds that this is very clear. Is it clear to everybody? Yes, sir, it's very clear. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think this is the end of the class, uh, since you don't have anything to add. So um, uh, thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoy the, uh, the explanations and maybe some of the complex uh, items or terminologies I think these come uh, become clearer this time. Thank you very much. Uh,